I've been asked to announce the following. Um, today, Tuesday, April 2nd, Rabbi Moshe Slopik Yavashir is sponsored by Manny Ruckelsman in memory of his mother, Yachad Bas Yaakov David. <clears throat> Manny Ruckles is a former student of mine uh, who lives now in Netanya, I believe. And uh, he heard I was here giving a shear, so he wanted to sponsor it. Uh, one of my, uh, one of the uh, gentlemen who sits next to me in shul was a friend of his, and he said, oh, you know Rabbi Snow? And Manny Ruckelsman said, sure, he was my first basketball coach. Uh-huh. There we go. Now, Rabbi Snow's <coughs> Rabbi Snow's shear <coughs> is generous, generously sponsored for the 2024-2025 academic year, sponsoring a whole year of my shiurim, and is being sponsored by Scott and Linda Hannaford, who uh, were who were uh, congregants of mine in the Young Israel Beth El Park, currently living in Pennsylvania. And uh, we wish a refuah to Scott and Linda. It's Hashem. Okay. Uh, this is uh, the fifth shia that I'm giving on Pirkei Avos. And we already, <coughs> we already s- spoke about the introduction to every time we learn Pirkei Avos, Kol Yisrael Yesh Lehem Chelek Le'olam Abba. All of Israel has a share in the world to come. Shenemar. As the Pasuk in Yeshaya says, your, my nation, your nation is all right, all of them are righteous together. We can fulfill 613 commandments. They are the branch of my planting, the work of my hand, that I may be glorified. A very positive opening to every Shia that we have because the opening statement tells us that we ought to be positive. We started with the first Mishnah, Moshe Kibel Torah Misinai. We, we discussed the opening statement that Moshe Kibel Torah Misinai, and the rest of the Mishnah, which we haven't discussed in any detail at all, but we're going to get to him, Yetz Hashem, today. We, start, we discussed Moshe Kibel Torah Misinai. We said he he received the Torah from Sinai because Sinai was not the tallest mountain and it implied a certain level of humility and Moshe Rabbeinu was the paragon of humility. Moshe was the most humble of men. But we are now going to continue on with the Mishnah. We're going to try to explain a little bit of the entire Mishnah and then we're going to go and crunch out, starting from the next words. It says, Moshe Kibbutz Torah Misinai, Umesoro li Yoshua. And he gave it over to Yoshua. The difference between a Kabbalah accepting, receiving directly from Hashem the tradition, the Torah, and giving it over and, and having it come to you through a Misora through being given over. What's the difference between a Kabbalah and a Mesorah we'll discuss in a few minutes. The Mishnah continues. Then the Yoshua Zekanim. Yoshua gave it over to the elders. Now these are not the typical Zekanim that we speak about later on in the history of the Jewish people, but we're going to see who these Zekanim were, particularly as we go through the Mishnah. So he gave it over to the Zekanim. Then Uzekanim Le Nevi'im. The Zekanim, who preceded the Nevi'im, we'll see who they were, uh, gave it over to the Nevi'im. And the Nevi'im, the Nevi'im implied Shmuel, Haramasi, and uh, Eli HaKohen, Shmuel Haramasi, and so on, all the way down, all the list of the entire Nevi'im prophets. By the way, if anybody wants a list of them, there is a fascinating addendum to the art scroll Tanakh, which has lists of all of the names of all the Zekanim and all the Nevi'im and all the Anshei Knesset HaGadol. If you can avail yourself of taking a look at that, you'll see names that you're very, very familiar with. I'm not going to go through them all now, but 
this game gave birth to Nevi'im, and Nevi'im misaru alat shekinas agdola. The Nevi'im gave it over to the people of the great assembly. The Anshek Nesagdola were a body of, like you'd say, uh, the Sanhedrin, in a sense. Uh, they were the ones who promulgated the sitter and put it together, and so many of the other important minhagim and mitzvahs the Rabbanan that they put together. And when it comes to the Anshek Nesagdola, the Mishnah says, Haim Omru Shlosha Dvarim. The Anshe Knesset HaGadola said three things. Now, by this time, over the history of the Jewish people, a thousand and more years have gone by since the giving of the Torah. And there was one central authority that got the Torah, that was Moshe. He was the only one about whom it says, Kibel Torah Misinai. But the truth of the matter is that the word kibel in this Mishnah is like, you, you remember your algebra, you know it's two times and then you have parentheses, x plus y. So it's not just two and then two x plus y, it's two times x, two times y, and so on. Here also, Moshe kibel Torah misinai, parentheses, umisara, and he gave it over, the Yeshua, the Canaan, the Rebbeim, and so on and so forth. And Moshe is also the key bail, not only refers to Moshe, but in a sense, not exactly the same way as we're going to see, but the key bail is times all the others, meaning they also had a certain Kabbalah Satorah. And that's what we do. We also have Kabbalah Satorah. Every time we learn Torah, every time we get some Torah, there is a Kabbalah Satorah. And when the Anshek Nesagdola, who were now 72 elders, and they were the, 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 the givers of so many mitzvahs mm-hmm. to Rabbanon, they recognized something. They recognized that from the original source of the Torah being mekabel, being, having a Kabbalah of Torah from Moshe Rabbeinu down to Yoshua, to the Canaan, to the Nevi'im, to Ansik there was a certain leveling out of the ability of any of the Anshe Knesset Agadola and maybe even their students to promulgate halacha and to teach everything. They think they couldn't absorb it all. Moshe was able to absorb it all. Yoshua was able to almost absorb it all, as we're going to discuss soon. But by the time it got down to the Anshe Knesset Agadola, it was impossible for any one individual to be able to have all the Torah at their fingertips at every moment. Now, we're, we're used to hearing about Gedolei Torah, people who were brilliant of mind and powerful of heart that were able to absorb the whole Torah. <coughs> if you've ever met any of these people, and there are a lot of them around, including some of the Gedolim who lecture here in the OU Center and here in Eretz Israel, there are people who almost know Kola Torah Kula. They know everything. No matter what you want to know, you, you just scratch them and the, all the Torah will come out. I've had the occasion, of course, of meeting such people. Uh, most recently, uh, the one who was most recently Nifter, uh, Rabbi David Feinstein, Zechariah Levacha, he was, uh, he knew, and call a Torah course. No matter what you asked him, anywhere, he, he didn't go around showing it off. You could almost not know that he was like this. And there's a book about Rabbi David Feinstein, by the way, and if you want to really get an insight into what true humility and greatness is, it's worthwhile reading. I don't know if you've ever read it, but it's really worthwhile. He knew everything. Instantly. The whole Torah was, was in front of his eyes. And of course, his father of Moshe, Zal, the same way. The whole Torah was in front of their eyes. These are people who are unique individuals, Yechide Segula. But the Anshe Knesset Agadola recognized that even though there are many, many great people who do have a handle on the whole Torah, nevertheless, it's not the same as it was by the time of Moshe and Yoshua and the Zikanim and the Nevi'im. 
And because it had, you might say, leveled out a little bit, because of that, they said the following three statements. And the Mishnah continues and tells us, Heim Omru Shlosha Devarim. They, the Anshek Nesak Dola, because it was now somewhat diffused, they said three things that were necessary for the future of the Jewish people in every way that anyone would ever discuss a topic of Torah. And what were those three things that were so vital that without these three things, the future of the Jewish people could not be strong? And here were the three things. Number one, Hevu misunim badin. Be deliberate in judgment. Think before you speak. Because if you're not exactly sure, you can cause that the halacha will be distorted. Now that's the simple explanation. But when we say, be deliberate in judgment, it also means don't jump to conclusions about how to judge another person. Don't think, of, oh, I, 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 I got this guy pegged. I, I, I got him pegged. Yeah. He's got long hair and he's wearing cut-up jeans and he's got a little Pepsi-Cola-sized bottle cap yarmulke. So I got him pegged. I know exactly this person. Don't jump to conclusions. You don't know. You just don't know. So have a Musun and Badin. Be very deliberate in judgment. And this goes a step further. We're going to have more time to discuss each and every one of these things as we crunch it later on in discussing in depth this particular concept. But it also means have a Musun and Badin. You have to be careful in judgment. Don't be so sure about a machlokes thinking you know exactly who is right and who is wrong until you really get into the situation and try to find what's at the core of the two protagonists who are in front of you. So you have to be very careful. And why? Because all of society is dependent on how you promote justice. If justice is skewered by a political view or by a desire to favor something over another, you're going to make some terrible, terrible errors in judgment. And people, when communism came out, they, they were all agog. Oh, what a wonderful idea, equality of the masses. Oh, what a wonderful, until it started impacting on every individual and taking away the freedoms that every individual desires. And democracy can do the exact same thing if it's not tempered with an understanding. And consequently, heaven was soon in badin. You have to be very deliberate in judgment. That's the first thing. Secondly, va'amidu talmidim harbei. Establish and set up many students. Because when you taught something, there are so many nuances in the teaching that you gave over, not every student is going to pick up on every single one of the exact same nuance or point that you're trying to make. Sometimes you'll have a, a group at a shear and they'll have a discussion about the shear a day or two later and one will say, you know what his main point was? And the other one will say, that wasn't the main point, that was a side point. You know, I know what the main point was. And so you have to have Talmidim Harbei who are going to be Misun and Badin so that they can be deliberately discussing the entire Shir and get the major points down where there's agreement on them. So the two things that were necessary in order for the Torah to be established with a strong sense of unity among Klai Yisrael is number one, you have to be deliberate in judgment and careful about how you speak and how you think. And secondly, even if you do that, make sure you have a lot of students so that maybe one got a point that the other did not get. And the third thing, Torah. make fences around the Torah. 
build a fence around the Torah. I'll, I'm going to give you one example that came up just recently in my shul. Where I daven every day. So, you know, there's a minog now in many of the what they can see us that we daven in that after Shmona Esrei, because of the matzav in the war, they say Avinu Malkein. Okay, it's uh, the Rav Malut came out with an idea that this is proper at this point to do, and any shul that does it has to follow through and. If you're David, let's say, let's say you, you don't agree. Let's say I don't agree that we should say Avinu Malkein, for instance, on Shabbos. There's a discussion uh, amongst the poskim whether Avinu Malkein should be said on certain days. Should it be said on the Shabbos? Should it be said on Rosh Chodesh? And so on. So what happens if the shul that you go to says Avinu Malkein on Shabbos and says Avinu Malkein on Rosh Chodesh and says Avinu Malkein on Yom Tov? Let's say you go to such a shul. But you feel it's not right to say Avinu Malkeinu on these days since the Ashkenazic postkim over the centuries has said you don't say Avinu Malkeinu on those days. What should you do? You feel it's not right because the Ashkenazic postkim hold like that. And your shul tav is Ashkenaz, but they say Avinu Malkeinu. What should you do? You should say Avinu Malkeinu. If the Tzibor says Avinu Malkeinu, you should say Avinu Malkeinu. If that's what everyone in the shul is doing, that's what you have to do. But David Feinstein, Zalu, I spoke about a few moments ago, had a case, uh, uh, there was a discussion among some of the Talmidim in the yeshiva. One of the Talmidim in the yeshiva said, if you take a look at the halacha in the Mishnah Brewer, it says that you're supposed to put your tefillin on before you come into the base medrash. So that when you walk into the base medrash, you're fully dressed with the, with all the accoutrements of the tefillin and so on and so forth. Now, 99% of people do not do this. 99% of the men, they come into the base medrash and they put the tefillin on where they sit, which is the most common thing that is done amongst Klai Yisrael. So these students were having a machlokas, a discussion amongst themselves. Ah, the Mr. Brewer says you're supposed to do it like this. And one guy, one particular fellow would stand outside the base medrash every morning and he would put on his tefillin, and all the other bachrim would walk in and put their tefillin on inside, and he started giving them arguments and saying, oh, the Mishnah Brewer said this, the Mishnah Brewer says that, how can you do this? So they came to Reb David, and they asked Reb David, what should we do? So he went over to the fellow who asked him the question, who was the guy who said that the halacha says you have to put it on outside, and uh, the, he came to Reb David, Zalman, and he said to him, Rebbe, doesn't it say in the Mishnah Brewer that you have to put on your tefillin outside? Reb David said, yeah, that's what it says in the Mishnah Guru. So shouldn't all the Bachram do that? He said, absolutely not. <laughs> he said, they said, why not? He said, because that's not the normal way. And despite the fact that the Mishnah Guru says it, but you're going to stand out as being abnormal. It's worse. It's not that you're going to stand out as being abnormal. You're going to make it that you are a big shot. Ich can besser. I know better. You are the. I know, I'm, I'm the guy you got to follow. And he said that's dangerous. Because the Mishnah says, Asu siyog la Torah. Make a fence around the Torah. If you're going to start with this business of doing your own thing when everybody else does the other thing, that's going to lead to people doing their own thing instead of doing the right thing. And you can't do that. That's not normal. Klai Yisrael will become fragmented and it won't last. So there's a fellow in our shul who says Avinu Malkeinu when he davens with the Yomit, he says it like everybody else says it, but he, every time he davens, when it comes to the Avinu Malkeinu Zachreinu L'chayim Tovim Avinu Malkeinu Zachreinu L'gul of Yeshua, the Refuah Shlema when it comes to Pinosa, he, now the Avinu Malkeinu says Avinu Malkeinu he comes and he says, He wants a good Pinosa. I don't blame him. I, I think it's very nice. <laughs> and, and, if, and if I could join his bandwagon, I'll take 20%. It'll be fine. No problem. I don't mind. But he added the word Tova. And it drives me nuts. Every time he does for the Yom, he adds the word Tova. So I, I didn't want to insult him. So I went over to him. Last night, I went over to him and I said, 
I, I, you know, I'm curious. It sounds like such a nice thing to say. What's your makor for this? Do, do you have a source for this? Maybe one of your rebbies did this, and he said, no, no, I have no source. I said, so what are you doing? He says, it's, I want a panasa tova. <laughs> I said, listen, I want a panasa tova too. But the sinner says, the panasa, and not tova, just a panasa. You know what, kedus, a chayil, a panasa, a Doesn't he have the word tova? He said, you don't think I should say it? I said, no, I don't think you should say it. And I'll tell you why. Because if you're going to add the word tova here, why don't you add the word tova on every other of you know, And before long, you're going to have 45 different guys saying of you know, in 45 different ways. And then of the, you know, is going to have 760 of you know, And you're never going to get through with davening. And people are going to start coming to shul. Do you see what can happen with any one word when it's not supposed to be done? You hear all this? And this is what the Mishnah meant when it said, Asu siyog la Torah. Make a fence around the Torah. Because if you don't protect what's in place, there's a good chance you're going to, the floodgates are going to burst open. And ha- what happens when the floodgates burst open? You have a water down or no Yiddishkeit at all. You have compromised ideals. You know, it's like the fellow who went over to his rabbi and he said, uh, is it okay? Uh, I know you're not allowed to, you know, go on a plane on Shabbos, you know. But if I'm wearing the seatbelt, it's like I'm wearing the plane, so it's okay, right? <laughs> you, you know, with the, with the, with the Gemara cup. If I'm wearing the plane, it's okay. This is what can happen when you start playing games with what the Torah tradition is all about. And that's why in the first Mishnah in Perkayovos we have the words Asusi Yogla Torah. You got to make a fence around the Torah and keep those fences. Because good fences make good neighbors. <laughs> it, 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 the Mishnah Ruhr was talking in the in Ilchus Tfilin about not coming in to the king without the royal garments. And that was the idea behind it. But over time, that became impossible for one reason or another. Uh, Some people used to walk, and you'll see it in Yerushalayim today also, they'll walk through the streets wearing talus and tefillin. And the, the, the danger with this is, number one, you may be walking past or right in the midst of things that are not allowed to be walked past or through. And it, the streets are not the same as uh, the streets of, like in Yiddish they would say, the Gassen von Jena Jorden, you know, the streets of uh, the old days where there was Kedusha and holiness at every step of the way. So because of the vicissitudes of life that the Jewish people have gone through, this has been the norm for many, many, many years and has been accepted as being normal. And Rabbi David, I should add, was, and it's, if you'll read the book, you'll see, and I, I know him personally, so I can tell you this is true. The most important thing was, you got to be normal. You got to be normal. Don't make stick, because that's what, that's what causes a problem. Okay. Okay, my second question. Save the other one for the end, if you don't mind. Up until... Yes. <laughs> and there are people today who can do that. Yes. All right, let's go back to the mission. So now we want to get to the next statement that we didn't f- fully flesh out, and that is beginning with the words of Besorah to Yehoshua. And he gave it over to Yehoshua. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question, people. What was Yehoshua's name? Sounds like a funny question. I'm calling me Yehoshua, but I'm asking you, what was Yehoshua's name? What, what, what do you say? Anybody have an idea what Yehoshua's name was? What? Yehoshua? Hosea. Right. His name was Hosea. Take a look at the beginning of Pasha Shlach, when it talks about the spies that were going out 
to see what Eretz Israel is going to be for them. And the Pasuk says uh, that Hashem uh, said to Moshe, He said, Shlach Lecha Anoshim, the Yasuru Eretz Kenan, right? Go send out people and they shall. The word by Yasuru, by the way, comes from the word tour, which means tourist. The Yasuru Eretz Kenan, they should go as tourists throughout the land, right? That's the Yasuru. We, we've, we've translated it you know, to mean, and they should spy out the land, but really a tourist is also doing the same thing. He's spying out the land, never knew so before. I'm touring the land. So send them out, they should tour the Eretz Canaan, and now you have to pay attention to the next line, because it's so perfectly worded by HaKadosh Baruch Hu to give us an insight into what we're going to be speaking about in this case. Asher ani no sein livnei Yisrael. Asher ani no sein. Hashem ani noten, livnei Yisrael. What does that mean? Which I am giving, present tense. The word noten, it doesn't say Hashem notati, doesn't say Hashem etain, doesn't say that I will give, doesn't say that I have given. It said Hashem ani noten, livnei Yisrael, which I am giving. I'm giving to the Bnei Yisrael. Once that sentence is said, that means that are they going out to spy the land out to figure out how to conquer it or to figure out which traveling and which way to go. But that's ridiculous. Hashem said, I'm giving it to the B'nai Yisrael. I'm giving it right now. And it doesn't matter whether, and the Pusik says later on, that when they went out, it says, and he said to them, Go, go up to the Negev. And go up the mountain. Now you should know they were coming from Egypt. So because they were coming from Egypt, and the Negev, of course, is south and is low, we would think, what, what's the pshat here in the Pasuk? Alu Zeba Negev. Go up to, because they're coming up from Egypt. So therefore it's Alu Zeba Negev. Go up into the south of Israel. And then go up to the mountain. I want you to see the land, what it is. And the, and the people that live on it. Are they strong or weak? Now wait a minute. Would it matter whether they're strong or they're weak? Give me a proof that it wouldn't make a difference. Because of that sentence I said you should keep in mind from the beginning of that parsha. I'm giving it to the Jewish people. I don't care, says Hashem, how strong they are. Or how weak they are. It's irrelevant. Why would I want you to know whether it's strong or weak if it's irrelevant? Because it impacts on us today. It's telling us nothing to be afraid of when you go to war for Hashem's war. Doesn't matter. Hashem ani no tend of Nei Yisrael. As long as we have Bnei Yisrael together, doesn't matter. It's Hashem ani no tank. Anyway, it goes on and on and speaks about this. Let's go back to the beginning of the Sedra for one minute, where the Psukim tell us which spies went out. And the Pasuk says, the Eilash Mosam. Here are their names of the people who went out to spy. Watch. Lamate Ruvain, Shamua ben Zakur. So who was the, 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 the spy for Ruvain? Shamua ben Zakur. I'm not testing you on this. It's okay. You don't got to remember. <laughs> Shamua ben Zakur. Let's go, keep the names in mind. Lamate Shimon, Shafat ben Chori. Lamate Yehuda, this name you can remember. Kolev ben Yefune. And the reason you should remember it is because we're going to see his name come up when it says, Umisara when Yeshua gave it over to the Zikanim, it includes Kolei ben Yefuna, which we're going to come to. Lamate Yisacha, Yigo ben Yosef. Lamate Ephraim, to the tribe of Ephraim, listen to the name, Hoshea ben Nun. It doesn't say Yeshua. It says Hoshea ben Nun. That was his name. His name was Hoshea ben Nun. Then it says Lamate ben Yamin, and so on, Lamate Zulun, and so on, and so on, and so forth. Okay, 
At the end of that paragraph, it says, Eila Shemosa Anosha, these are the names of the people, Asher Sholach Moshe Lotoris Oretz, which Moshe sent out to spy out the land. Vayikra Moshe, here it is, Vayikra Moshe, and Moshe called Lehosheya bin Nun Yehoshua. And Moshe called Hosea ben Nun by the name Yehoshua. Moshe changed his name. His original name was Hosea ben Nun. Moshe came along and changed his name. Now, why did he change his name? Why did he add a Yud at the beginning, Yehoshua, instead of Hosea? Hosea ben Nun. Rashi says he wanted to protect him from the Calvinist spots. From the what? Protect him from the council of the spies. Right. Exactly right. It says Rashi wanted to protect him, to, to guard him, from the suggestion of the council of the spies. What about all the other guys? Only Yahushua has to be protected. What about Kole ben Yafuna? He was a goodie. Go ahead. So, 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 what? Why? Why? Why did he only change Hoshua's name? If Ko Yoshiach, what he meant to say, Ko Yoshiacha, Hashem should protect you, may Atzas Miraglim, from the advice of the spies. But only Yehoshua needed that protection. Kolei ben Yefuna didn't, and all the other, all the others, they didn't need that protection. They needed it more, maybe, because they succumbed and gave in. So what's this business? Only Yehoshua, by Yikra Moshe, Hoshea ben Nun Yehoshua, only him. And there's a difference between Hoshea and Yehoshua. Tremendous difference. Okay? Hoshea is Hosha, which is saving in the past tense. Yehoshua, when you add a Yud at the beginning of that verb, it becomes he will say. So he changed Hosea, past tense, into Yehoshua. He should be saved. Only Yehoshua? Not everybody else? I have another question. If Hosea ben Nun is mentioned back here when it says, Lamate Ephraim Hosea ben Nun, why didn't it say right there, Lamate Ephraim Hosea ben Nun, Vayikra Moshe lo Hosea ben Nun Yehoshua? Why didn't it say it there? Why did he wait until after all the spies I mentioned and then change his name, Vayikra Moshe lo Hosea ben Nun Yehoshua? Why didn't he say it when his name is first mentioned? Instead, he goes through all the names of all the spies, and then he calls Hosea ben Nun the name Yehoshua. Why did he do that? So Rav Shem Hirsch so beautifully, Mamish, on target, explains, because when he changed Hosea's name to Yehoshua, he wasn't talking just to Hosea ben Nun. He was talking to all the spies. Vayikra Moshe, Hosea ben Nun. Moshe called to all those who felt that the salvation of Hashem was in the past tense, I want you to know each and every one of you is Yehoshua. Each and every one of you needs protection from the advice of the spies. It's not just in the past. It's in the future. So Yehoshua's name was actually Hosea, but when, I, when Moshe Rabbeinu changed his name, he did it in order that Yehoshua be the leader. He was his Talmud, that he would be the leader of everyone else in that, in that chevra, which he was ultimately, with his best friend Kole ben Yefuna. And Hashem and Moshe Rabbeinu meant to save not just Yeshua from the Atzas Meraglim, but all of the spies from Atzas Meraglim. That's why it's mentioned at the end. Now, we said that Moshe Kibel Torah Misinai, Umesora li Yehoshua, and he gave it over to Yehoshua. The Gemara Baba Basra makes mention of the following. It says, Pene Moshe 
כפני החמה. פני יהושע כפני הלבנה. Yes? The face of Moshe was like the sun. The face of Yeshua was like the moon. What's the difference between them? Okay, so the, the sun is the source. The sun is the original source of the light. The moon is a reflection of that light. By the way, <coughs> we say Kiddush Levana. Okay, we say Bechas Achama also, once every 27 years, 28 years, depending on how you count it. That's because supposedly the world in its axis and in its constellations is at the exact same point at the time of creation, according to the Gemara. So, but the moon, every single month, waxes and wanes. It goes away. You don't even see it. It disappears. We do Kiddush Levana. Not only that, but just this week. We're going to be reading in the Maft here, HaChodesh Hazel Lochem Rosh Chodoshim. Now, how would you translate that sentence? Anybody want to offer in a translation? HaChodesh Hazel Lochem Rosh Chodoshim? This 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 moon is the beginning of all moons, right? Yeah. Right? For you, Hachodesh Hazelochem, this new Chodesh. Hachodesh Hazelochem, this new month, for you, is the first of all months. And sure enough, we count all the months from Nisan. But if you take a look at the word Chodesh, Chodesh doesn't mean month. Chodesh means new. Chodesh means new. Again, we go to Rav Shamshu for others. I recommend uh, to read whenever you can. HaChodesh HaElochem, this renewal, this renewal is for you the beginning of all renewals. The month of Nisan is a renewal. It's the beginning of <laughs> all renewals. Because in Chodesh Nisan, we got out of Mitzrayim. And it was a renewal of the existence of the Jewish people in power. And this renewal should be a sign for you of all renewals. And every time the moon catches the reflection of the sun, it should remind you, us, Claudia Israel, that we too can renew and reflect the light of Hashem. Just like the sun is the source of the light of the moon, and the moon, when it catches that reflection, it's a renewal of the month, and it's a renewal of the newness, so too, when you reflect the light of Hashem, you are doing the exact same thing as the moon. You're reflecting the light of Hashem. The Jewish people... Reflect the light of Hashem. And even though at times we may not reflect the light of Hashem because we're humans and we don't always get it perfectly right. But that doesn't mean you give up. That doesn't mean it's all over. This renewal should be for you the beginning of all renewals. And remember, if I don't reflect the light of the sun at this moment, it's because maybe, maybe I didn't catch that light well enough. But there's no question that in a few days when the moon once again reflects the light of the sun, I too can think to myself, Bless the Hashem, it gives me the ability to renew myself, to catch the light of that sun. So Yeshua ben Nun, was the one who had to lead the Jewish people and reflect the light of that sun. Moshe, Pnei Moshe, Kepnei Hachama. The face of Moshe was like the sun, it had its original source. Pnei Yeshua, 
Nei Halavana. The face of Yoshua was like the face of the moon. He reflected Moshe Rabbeinu's light. He reflected it. And because he reflected it, he became the next leader. I, I go to what time? 10 o'clock? 10 o'clock? Five moments, okay. Seven what? Seven, Seven moments, okay, good. I don't think we're going to get to it today, but I'm going to mention it anyway so that we can have a leg up on the next shear. Do you know the name of the woman that Yoshua married? Rachel. Rachel. Okay. In Paragimel in Sefer Yoshua, what name, what description is attached to Rachel? Okay, you gave me a nice <laughs> interpretation, Lashon Nekiya. But the Lashon in the Pasuk is Rochav HaZona. And the word Zona, Rashi and the Radak and others explain, and it's based on the Gemara, which I'm not going to read today, but it's Gemara in Zvach and Kufta Zayim, where Zona means Mizonos, an innkeeper, that she gave Mizonos to others. But the Gemara doesn't interpret it that way. It uses a much, much not nice term, and keeps it at the original interpretation. I'm mentioning this because, what are you telling me? That Yoshua ben Nun married the chief harlot that existed in all of the land of Canaan? That she was known as the, quote unquote, Zona? And she married Yoshua. By the way, they had children. No sons, only daughters. But their daughters, those daughters gave birth to seven different Nevi'im. Here's the point. I don't care how far away you've been. I don't care what mistakes we've made in our lives. But if you're like Yoshua and you pick up the reflection of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you could become Yehoshua's wife and the mother of Nevi'im. A human being, a Jew, has the opportunity of tshuva and that tshuva is a return to the reflection of catching the light of the sun. And when you catch that light, it's HaKadosh Azel HaChem Rosh Chodoshim. It's the beginning of all renewals in which your life takes on a bright shine and a new meaning. I wanted to end with that point. We'll have more Mitzvah session about that next week. Now I'll take it. There's a question or two. Okay. Mitzvah session. Mitzvah session next week. Yeah, my pleasure. Next week we'll meet again in Mitzvah session.